So, I'm sure all of you have seen the monks and how the monks from Thailand and Sri Lanka are different from the monks from China and Japan and Korea and how they are different from the monks or the Lama from Tibet. But if you focus on the monks from Tibet and Sri Lanka, you notice that there's one thing that they do that no one else does, which is that they give up on all means of production. They don't grow their own food, they don't try to become doctors, they don't do any of that. Whereas if you go to the Chinese monks, they, 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 uh, they grow their own food, or many of them um, are medical, medical doctors, and they have a way of making their own living. The Thai monks and the Sri Lanka monks and the uh, Marama monks, they're more traditional. They are what we call the Theravada monks. Theravada means elders. Their training is actually direct descendant uh, from the training from Buddha himself 2,600 years ago. And one of the things that they do is they give up on all means of production. They become beggars. In fact, the word for monks in Pali is bichu. Bichu means beggars, which is kind of interesting because if you look at all the disciples of the historical Buddha, all the ones that have renunciated are beggars, and all of the ones that are householders like me and you, we're not beggars. There's no one beggar that had managed to become Buddha's disciples. But yet, all the ones that renunciate are beggars. And the reason is that in order to renunciate, and because back in those days, all the students that followed Buddha and became uh, monks were very, very rich, rich people. And so they have to learn to renunciate. And so every morning they get up. And when I visit um, Thailand and Myanmar, I, 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 I often uh, get up very early in the morning and observe them go back for food. They would go out and back for food. And so they actually are practicing renunciation, but at the same time they give an opportunity for the villagers to practice um, compassion and uh, giving. But you notice that there's one thing that they do. The one thing that they always do is they walk barefooted. So actually, that is part of the spiritual practice, is that they're doing walking meditation. They do walking meditation. Walking meditation is actually a very, very important part of the Buddhist training. So in the past, I talked about the difference between the Buddhists and the yogis. Remember now, the historical Buddha was a yogi. He was a yogi, and he actually decided that he wanted to go a little further from being from the yogic tradition. And so what he came up with was the, was, the, was, the, was the Buddhist teaching. And so you have to ask, so how is that different from the traditional yogic training? And by the way, how does the yogic training differ from the Taoist training? Because again, a yogi, a very, very famous yogi, Bodhidharma, the 29th disciple, 29th generation disciple of the Sikor Buddha came to China and taught the Taoists how to meditate. And so these are all kind of connected. And so you have to ask, you said, oh, what is this all about? How, how are they different? I'm often reminded of the feeble, of the five blind person trying to figure out what an elephant looked like. Right? And you know that. So if someone were to come to me and say, Stanley, is what you're teaching Qigong? Is what you're teaching yoga? Is what you're teaching you know, meditation? Or is it the Theravada meditation? Or is it the, the Mahayana teaching? I would have to ask you, so which part of the elephant you want to look at? Because it's the same elephant. So if I were to ask the question again, what is walking meditation? And why is Buddhist teaching, where does it differ from the yoga, yogic teaching? If I were to ask that question again, the answer lies in the Bible. The answer lies in the Old Testament. The answer lies in the book of Genesis. 
and you say, well, why are you bringing that in here, in this conversation? It's just another part of the elephant. People tend to look at their part of the elephant. But if you look at the entirety of the elephant, it's the same elephant. So what, did, what, does, what, does, what does it say in the book of Genesis? In the very, very last day, after God had created everything for Adam and Eve, he told Adam and Eve, and he says, this garden, this garden Eden, was created for you. These plants that have fruits, that's for you. These plants that have grains and, and the grass, they're for the animals. In other words, you're supposed to be a vegetarian. You're here to protect the animal, be friends with them, not here to eat them. <laughs> anyway, but he also said one thing. He says, you can eat anything. You can eat anything off the tree except this one tree. And we all know about this one tree, right? And what is the name of the tree? The tree is called the tree of knowledge. You would have to ask the question, what is so bad about the knowledge that you couldn't eat from? Knowledge is good, right? So what is so bad about the tree of knowledge that you couldn't eat from? Because God said, if you eat from the tree of knowledge, you will die. In other words, you would die because you would give up your eternity. Meaning that you would fall into this realm of desire and you would continue to see rebirth in this realm of desire. You can never come back. So what is so bad about this tree that is called the tree of knowledge? What is knowledge? Just look it up. I did. Because I'm not going to spend time worry about what the English word means. I got to go back to the Hebrew. The tree of knowledge is about the brain. Knowledge is about the brain. Knowledge is nothing more than memory. It's nothing more than memory and bait and making analysis and judgment based on memory. So what God tells you is that don't get attached to your brain. Don't get attached to your thinking mind because once you get attached to your thinking mind, you start to discriminate. You start to prejudge. And now all of a sudden you get attached to your emotions. You get attached to these hindrances called the clinging, the ill will, and so forth and so on. And that's exactly what Buddha have learned to do. He decided that as he was practicing the yoga tradition, he was able to not only escape the realm of desire, that he was actually in the realm of form and formless. We talked about that in the past. In fact, so much so that he had re reached the upper, upper part of the formless realm. And he decided that in order to escape that, in order to escape samsara, he has to give up on his brain. So you would have to ask again, but how, why is this that I have to give up my brain? I'm not asking you to give up your brain, I'm just asking you to give up your thinking, your discriminations, and become someone who doesn't judge other people, just accept people as who they are. In other words, this thing that we call the intellect is actually just a very tiny part of our intellectual system. We focus so much on the brain that we forgot about the spiral core. We focus so much on this that we forgot the spiral core. When someone takes that three-point shot at the end of the basketball game, he's in the zone. He's not thinking. He's, not, he's trained not to use the thinking mind. He's completely focused on the spiral core. He's completely focused on sensing the outside world. Because all the sensors, all the nerve ending ends in the spiral core. Then it's delivered to the brain where you can make your judgment. Ignore that judgment. Let go of the judgment. Focus on the sensation. That's what Buddha learned. That's what he did. And he taught his disciples to do that in the walking meditation. So one thing I'd like to add to this comment that I made about the book of Genesis 
is a beautiful comment that just was posted by Wynn, where she said, or he or she said that Genesis, because it was that tree of knowledge that those paralyzing emotion of shame and guilt came, which is true. By the way, Adam and Eve didn't put on that fig leaf until they ate from the tree of knowledge. There was no sense of guilt and shame. There was no reason to cover any of the body part that God gave you. It was only after they ate from the tree of knowledge that they became to develop shame and guilt. Very good comment. Okay?